Hi, my name is Jason Magoni, and I'm from the JPS Sports Medicine Fellowship in Fort Worth, Texas. This talk is part of the Family Medicine Radiology Educational Series, and today I'll be talking about the adult lumbar spine. I have no financial disclosures regarding this topic. Our objectives today are to learn a systematic approach to reading radiographs of the adult lumbar spine and review three common adult findings on x-ray, discuss those clinical conditions and correlations that those x-ray findings may mean. So the most common views of the lumbar spine that we get are the AP, the lateral, along with the spot or cone down as part of that lateral, and then the left and right obliques. When you look at the AP or the anterior posterior imaging, what you're gonna look at is the vertebral bodies, the spinous processes, the pedicles, and the transverse processes. When you look at the vertebral bodies, it's important to count them and make sure that you're dealing with your typical five lumbar spine vertebral bodies. To do this, I usually assume that we're dealing with 12 rib bearing verte vertebral bodies above it. So the last rib that you see is T12, and then count the pedicles across L1, L2, L3, L4, and L5. It's important to count because there are some congenital conditions that may alter these count or some other morphological features that you have to look out for. When you look at the spinous processes, you wanna make sure that they're aligned midline, that the image is not rotated or that there's not a rotational component to the, to the patient while they're standing. You want to look at the pedicles, make sure that they're symmetrical in size and shape, and also about symmetrical in height. And then again, the transverse processes you're going to look at there. Uh, again, there could be some morphological changes and some congenital conditions that we could talk about at a later date. On the lateral x-ray or the lateral view, again, you want to look at those vertebral bodies. We'll talk a little bit about the three columns, the disc spaces, the posterior elements, and the neural foramina. Specifically on the vertebral bodies, you want to look at the shape, make sure that they're square, that there's not any wedging either anteriorly or posteriorly, and that most of them are shaped just about the same. You want to check their alignment. So you want to look at the front alignment or the anterior alignment, make sure the anterior vertebral bodies line up. And again, looking at the posterior vertebral bodies and make sure they align. That plays into our three column port here. So when you're talking about fractures of the lumbar spine, which we'll talk again at a later date, but you wanna make sure that you're paying attention to the anterior, the middle, and the posterior columns and the alignment of those. You wanna also look at the disc spaces, make sure that they're roughly equal in size and that they're uh, large enough to be robust. Uh, again, you wanna look at the posterior elements, talking about the lamina itself and the pars interarticularis. And then the neuroforamina, you wanna make sure that they're patent, that there are no osteophytes in the way because those exiting nerve roots can be impinged if that's the case. In the lateral or cone down spot view, this is really just a close up view of the L5-S1 level. And it's used as a different technique because you have other anatomical features of the pelvis that get in the way. It allows you to see the disc space and the alignment at that level. And then in looking at the obliques, this is where you're looking for your facet joints, your pars interarticularis, and you wanna be able to identify that infamous Scotty dog that everybody talks about. When you talk about the facet joints, you have the superior articulating process coming from the level below the inferior articulating process coming from the level above. And this creates the facet joints, which helps to uh, limit extension and rotation of the lumbar spine. The pars interarticularis itself is famous for becoming fractured, and we can talk about that at a later date as well. Uh, but this is the view where you're going to look for that. And then the Scotty dog, a lot of people have some difficulty identifying the Scotty dog. I thought this might just help a little bit. When you're talking about the pedicle being the head of the dog, the superior articulating process being the ear, the inferior articulating process being the front leg, and then the lamina and the rest of the posterior elements making up the backside of the dog. Some pitfalls to think about when you're looking at lumbar spine x-rays. You wanna make sure that the patient is positioned correctly, that they're standing appropriately and that they're not rotated or have one hip or shoulder sitting higher or lower than the other. And this can cause some, cause some false positive readings in your x-rays. <clears throat> you also wanna check your penetrance. Under, under penetrated x-rays can cause you to miss things. Over penetrated x-rays can cause you to have difficulties identifying the elements. So the one on the left is under penetrated. The one on the right is very nearly appropriately penetrated, maybe just a touch over penetrated, but you can definitely see the bony elements more clearly in the image on the right. And then some other artifacts that can get in the way, specifically the lumbar spine is bowel gas. You wanna make sure you're not over reading a dark spot when you're looking at a lumbar spine film due to bowel gas. So let's talk about three common adult conditions of the lumbar spine. The first one we're gonna talk about is degenerative disc disease. When you have a patient that you suspect has degenerative disc disease, you're gonna talk about a patient who has low back pain that's a little bit worse with flexion. 
may or may not have radicular symptoms, but if they do, they should be dermatomal and should correlate to the level of pain. Usually this is a patient that's 40 years old or older, although you can see patients who are much younger with degenerative discs and um, those can be tricky. In the physical exam, again, you're gonna have pain that's worse with flexion, not extension. If they have neuroforaminal compromise, you may have a positive straight leg raise test. If they have sensory deficits, they should be again dermatomal. And if they do have weakness, which is typically a very late finding and more emergent, they should have myotomal weakness. They may or may not also have diminished reflexes. Again, it's a late finding and a more significant finding that requires quicker evaluation. On the lateral view, you'll see here that you'll have a loss of disc space height. Disc space height. So these are very nice and robust disc spaces. As you get higher at this T12L1, you can see that there is much less space here and there's already becoming in plate changes. Uh, this is an example of degenerative disc disease on the lateral view. When you look at the spot or cone down view, again, this is specific for L5S1, you notice this nice robust disc space here, much less so here. Again, this is uh, very obvious on the X-ray. There are some other imaging uh, technologies that you can use, specifically MRI here. Even on the X-ray, you can look and see, when you see L1, L2 on the MRI, you can see some bulging here and some darkness of this disc. When you look here again, five, four, three, two, one, when you're looking at the L1, L2 disc space, this is just a little bit more narrow and a little bit more sclerotic. So you can even see early changes in degenerative disc disease on the X-ray. Once again, you wanna make sure that that neuroframen is patent so that exiting nerve root has space. That's more an MRI finding. So you can see that disc bulging back there, but those are things to correlate with MRI in your clinical evaluation. How do we treat these patients? A lot of times in the younger patients, we have them rest because these will resolve on their own. Um, although exercise and weight loss can help immensely. A lot of times we'll send patients to physical therapy to help with those exercises. And we'll use some medications, whether pain medications or other medications to help with radiculopathy. Some patients will also get injections like corticosteroid injections into the epidural spaces to help with these symptoms. But if all of that conservative management fails, at times these patients do have to have surgery to stabilize that segment. The next condition we're gonna talk about is lumbar spondylosis. So these patients tend to have low back pain that tends to be worse with extension and rotation. They may experience gelling or stiffness after they sit for a long period of time. And this pain tends to be axial or more midline as opposed to going down legs. It also tends to happen um, to radiate a little bit along the belt line, especially in those lower levels like L4, L5, and L5 and S1. Less often these patients have radicular symptoms, but they could be present if there's a lot of synovitis and causing neuroforaminal compromise. Again, the common patient demographic here is someone who's 40 plus, although it can happen a little bit in younger patients. The physical exam here is pretty consistent with pain with extension and facet loading. And when I'm talking about facet loading, what I mean is a rotation either to the left or to the right of the lumbar spine at the, at the low back, and then having them go into extension that actually loads the facets. They may also be tender to palpation over the facets and the paraspinal muscles. When you're looking at spondylosis in the AP view, what you're gonna see commonly, especially in late stage spondylosis is osteophytes. You wanna make sure that you check that alignment Make sure that you're looking at the spinous processes and looking at the pedicles, making sure they're even. Oftentimes in late um, spondylosis at these facets, you'll start to see collapse of those facet joints and it'll make that alignment off. On the lateral, again, you start to see osteophytes. These osteophytes aren't directly related to the facet joints, but they are trying to stabilize the lumbar spine because of the pain and the instability in the facet joint itself. And again, in the oblique, this is where we really pay attention to our facets because they're easiest to see. You'll start to notice sclerosis and other narrowing of these facet joints. The higher you get, the, the, the higher levels you see, the more significant the spondylosis is in that patient. Again, this is just the other side, the right view, noticing that significant sclerosis and narrowing of facet joints. Additional imaging for lumbar spondylosis usually isn't needed because it's a finding that's a bony finding and it's usually pretty easy to see on x-ray, but you may need an MRI uh, because you want to make sure if there's a, a significant synovitis that it's not compromising the neuroforamina. And also because most cases of low back pain are multifactorial, it's not just one cause of low back pain. Again, you can see here that this facet joint is very uh, dysmorphic. It looks like there's a lot of synovitis that's compressing that neuroforamina. Treatment options here, 
Again, osteoarthritis needs to move, so exercise and weight loss is key. Physical therapy for core stability is great. NSAIDs can be used like any other arthritis, but you need to use them sparingly and safely. These patients can benefit from corticosteroids into the facet joints themselves. And in rare cases, these patients may require surgery if their pain continues or the segments become unstable. And lastly, we'll talk about spondylolisthesis. These patients usually have what I call positional low back pain. It may be inflection, it may be extension, but if that segment is unstable, it can come and go. It can be in either flexion or extension. Typically, these patients have severe degenerative disc disease or spondylosis or even uh, bilateral spondylolysis, which allows for that segment, uh, one on top of the other to become unstable and the vertebral bodies to shift over the top of one another. Again, these patients can have pain in either flexion or extension. And it may present similarly to degenerative disc disease because a lot of times these patients have underlying degenerative disc disease. The neuro exam here is key. When you look at the x-ray or the radiograph, you wanna look at the lateral and you wanna see if there's a shift of one vertebral body on top of another. So this one is an anterior listhesis because we describe this on the level above to the level below. So the level above here is anterior. So there's anterior listhesis of L4 on L5. We also grade these grades one through four. And the way we do that is we divide up the vertebral body into quartiles. So 25, 50, 75, or hundred percent. And depending on the amount of shift on one level above the other, that's how we grade it. So this patient has an anterior listhesis of let's see, five, four, three, four. So an anterior listhesis of three on four of 25%. So I would call this a grade one anterior listhesis. Had this vertebral body shifted farther up here, it's the 50%, that would be grade two, this would be grade three, and a full shift is a grade four. Those are uncommon, but again, you can see the disruption of the posterior elements here, which is allowing for this anterior listhesis. <clears throat> on the spot view, this really helps us to look closely at the L5-S1 level. Again, on this full lateral, it's very hard to see down here, but in the same patient, as you get the spot view, you can see that there's an anterior listhesis of L5 on S1. Again, I would probably call this a grade one. One of the things we need to make sure of is that these uh, segments or these uh, areas are stable. And the way we do that is we get some special lateral views called flexion and extension views. And we wanna look to see if that segment is translating one on top of the other. Typically we describe three, three millimeters of translation as significant. So you wanna look at the flexion versus the extension and see if that segment has moved more than three millimeters. If it does, those patients typically get referred for a surgical evaluation. Additional imaging, you have to be a little bit careful when you get an MRI because most lumbar spine MRIs are done with the patient laying flat, and that may not allow you to see the specific amount of listhesis, but you can typically find the reasons, whether that's severe degenerative disc disease or pars interarticularis deficits or other injuries that may have caused the listhesis. What are our treatment options? Again, exercise and weight loss is always a good idea when you're dealing with patients with low back pain. Physical therapy is used to try to maintain core stability and really help them to splint that level, especially if it's stable. Medications can be used again for pain control. If there's a periodic radiculopathy, you may also use medications to treat that. Injections here typically are used to try to calm down nerve roots, corticosteroid injections into the epidural space. And then again, if the segment is unstable or the pain is refractory, these patients tend to get referred for surgery for stabilization. So in summary, we talked a lot about looking at technique, being aware of the pitfalls of the images that you're looking at. Make sure that you're comparing one level to the next. It's always nice to have something to compare to. Always check your alignment, whether you're looking AP, lateral, or in the obliques, alignment, alignment, alignment is very important. You wanna look for the bright and the dark spots, so looking for sclerosis or potentially any artifacts. And then advanced imaging is very common in the low back. A lot of MRIs are ordered uh, because there's a lot of multifactorial back pain and other causes. So it's important to correlate that advanced imaging to your radiograph and to the patient's condition, making sure that you're treating the right thing. But that's gonna conclude our talk on the adult lumbar spine radiograph for the family medicine series. Thank you very much.